motion to approve the agenda and minutes of the scene, and uh, there are no liquor licenses. Can I second that? I got a motion to second it. Bring it to discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. So you don't think I have some long hair and can't be free. I am a retired Omaha police officer. I worked for 30 years in Omaha and had an excellent reputation. Plenty. Even the chief loved me. I moved to Glenwood as soon as I retired three and a half years ago because I wanted to live in peace and quiet in the country. I got tired of being recognized by meth addicts and I frequently arrested. Part of town I worked and I drew my hair off. But I, I am actually not a drug addict or anything like that. So I moved down here. And then for the first few months, it was idyllic. I have three acres kind of close to the winery. And I knew nothing about Mills County. Friends of mine found the property for me. And uh, several of my colleagues live in Mills County. It was one of them that told me about this house in Green Avenue. So I moved in. I'm, I'm going to get to my point quickly. But uh, the first three months was excellent. There was this wonderful family that lived there. And then they moved out. The police ran out. And these people moved in. And it's been a nightmare since then. And the reason why I bought the house, the man asked me if I wanted to keep his chickens. I said, sure. So over the next year, their dogs, they have five of them, kept killing my chickens over and over and over again. I tried to settle it with them peacefully. I even asked the man, could you please, just like, like your dogs, he smirked, rolled his eyes, and said, why don't you just shoot them? I said, I don't want to shoot them. I ended up, more chickens dying, bought a shotgun, first time in my life. I still have my 45, six hour, you know, service weapon. You can't hit it, it's hard to hit a running dog with a 45, and I don't want to shoot a dog. So I bought a shotgun, and uh, this kind of ties into it. I actually, the woman that lived there, who was a meth addict, and had been arrested by the Omaha police, years earlier for dealing meth, which I didn't know at the time, accused me of pointing my gun at her. I actually got arrested. The deputy wrote in the report, not, nothing of what I said, only what the woman said, and arrested me for a felony assault. I swear in the Bible, my whole career, I never pointed any weapon at a person I knew was unarmed. She came outside while I was trying to get a shot at the dog, but it ran back to her property. I knew I couldn't take a shot that way because I was trained heavily in shotguns. And anyway, she told the deputy I pointed the gun at her. And that was just a pure life. I said that was for a felony. Nada dropped it down eventually to a harassment. I was out $2,200 paying my attorney fees. He told me not to fight it, not to fight the felony because it would cost me $7,000. Well, I paid the $2,000 just to get it dropped down to a misdemeanor, something I didn't do. That the deputy didn't include anything on these in the report or what I said. It was, which would have, I had a bunch of dead chickens, he rolled his eyes and smirked, and then, went, and then suggested that a fox did it. And then he wrote on the report, not, 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 well, but anyway, I get to my point. So I buy a shotgun after that, and uh, a year later, more dead chickens, I try to get a decent shot at the dog and I shoot it, kill it. Sergeant Pittman shows up and is quite polite and tells me you should have done this a long time ago. I wanted to avoid this. So the woman that accused me of pointing the gun at her got at me got at her got, got evicted by the guy that owns the property. And uh, of course saying the other nasty things, not about me, but about his son that lives in the house. So the problem stopped for a while. Well, now it, it started up again, and uh, the, another different dog, obviously, keeps coming on my property. I've asked his brother, who now lives with him, to knock it off, stop it. I, did, I want peace, and he told me, you effing pussy. So I, I can't talk to these people. I tried over and over. I, I, and I, I, called, I called 911 again. Ironically, the same deputy showed up. He was quite polite to me this time. I'm friends with Travis Otter. He's going to be his boss soon. So he's quite, 
quite pleasant to me now. I'm rolling in his eyes and smirking. And he, he goes over and talks to him. Well, I asked him if he could cite, here's my issue, if he could cite them for anything. And he said, quite politely, on the way to my house, so I've, had, I've had, had to call seven or eight times in the interim, different deputies showed up. And he called, talked to Nada. And Nada told him, you tell me to go to this meeting and ask you people if you can do something about a dog at large law so the deputies can cite the people. And I'm thinking, because I found this quite, to be quite effective in my career, that if you cite people for certain whatever, they don't, they'll tend to stop doing it because they're getting hit in a pocketbook. That's it. If, if somehow, some way, this can end by maybe just one citation. But I'm actually worried now that it's, it's just going to get worse and worse. Because they started screaming things at me when, when the deputy, as soon as the deputy left. Oh, it's on the, the, the that night I shot the dog, the husband showed up. Minutes later, he got, must have got off work early, screeched into my driveway with his truck, got out, and he told me, you better think about moving right now. I made a threat report, which looks like it didn't go anywhere. Because in the threat statute, at least in Douglas County in Omaha, you had to be a specific threat. I had to say, I'm going to cut your head off. I tried to say you're going to get it one of these days. They don't, the county attorney wouldn't consider that a threat. So you have to be, so maybe that's why nothing happened to you have to say something specifically, or I'm going to blow your house up. So that's that's where I stand. I mean, I'm scared. I'm actually scared to live in my house now. Do you have a fence to keep no, those chickens? No, no, no. I, I actually have. I I free range them the whole time. If you saw my property, this would help. It's quite large. My chickens actually stay. It's it's probably a hundred yards. They stay by these huge lilac bushes. The hawks and eagles don't get them. I, I found out chickens actually are pretty clever that way. They can't be seen from um, predator birds. So they stay there the whole day. They don't even get, this dog has to run across my whole property to get to the chickens to chase them and kill them. And also, the fence would actually, it would have to be about 300 yards long. I don't, I've never priced the fence, but I've heard about 300, unless anybody else knows, anybody else on farmland, 300 yards of, of building a fence. But it would, it would have to go around my whole property, It'd be quite expensive, when really all that man has to do is pin his dogs up. And then the problem goes away. But he's, he's not going to. It's happened dozens of times. So. So do the other neighbors, do they complain? Of the, I have this one really terrific neighbor, the best neighbor I've ever had in my life. And the dogs could see my chickens in the distance. He, we're, we're quite a distance apart. I live on Kane Avenue, and it's different. And it's... Where is it? Oh, 24736. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Uh, this is... Wait. Yeah, this is me. This is where my chickens are at. This is the... Wait a minute. A no, no, here I am. Yeah. This is their property. So my, my outbuilding is right here. My chickens hang out right here. The dog has to run all the way across. I, so I'd have to put a fence so this dog could see them. I mean, it's probably more than 300 yards. It's probably, so it'll be could quite you expensive. put a fence just right around that shed instead of your whole property? Oh. I'm just saying because oh. I raise a lot of livestock and chickens and birds and or put up a, a notarium, or no, a, what do you call it? Atrium. Oh, I don't atrium. Atrium. Well, atrium. A, well, the chickens can, some of, I have these four chickens that were on the endangered species list a couple years ago. I don't know if they still are. That's why I look at this as just more, I have four different species of chickens. I kind of, actually I got rid of them for a while. I gave them to somebody in trainers so I wouldn't have to deal with this. But I kind of missed it. So I got these kind of exotic chickens. Uh, and they can fly almost like a pheasant. So I'd have to build them. Yeah, I guess I could. Something to think about, because then if the dogs got into it. Oh, they couldn't, yeah, they wouldn't be able to get into it. That probably wouldn't be nearly as expensive. Well, no, definitely wouldn't be nearly as expensive. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Just an idea. But it, it, 
I mean, if the other neighbors complain of his job grooming, I mean, we're not solving the problem. No, oh no, you're right. Well, the, the, the nice neighbor, this guy here, best guy I've ever met, I think. So friendly. And he says the, he said the, the dog, the two of the dogs that were killing my, my chickens never ever entered his property once. Because they have to, because, you know, they don't see his, his livestock down here. They said that that's a matter of, that's why they don't go on his property. So, uh, you know what, uh, I could just, I could see how much it would cost. It wouldn't have to be that big. It'd have to be and it, tall. I don't, do they make, do they make chain link that tall though? I mean, how tall? You can, you can close the top too. I've seen some type of dogs that have them close. Yeah, we put a net. Peacocks and such like that. And it, it truly works. I mean, we keep the coons out, so. Is that Tim or uh, Jake, Chase, that's your neighbor? Yes. Okay. And uh, it's not going well. Okay. And his mom called me here yesterday crying. He did something. I don't even want to say. Okay. Yesterday. I don't want to say because it's a personal thing and it's, she confided to me, but it's, I'm, I'm actually scared now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, things are not going well. I even took a picture of the property, his property. You saw, what, you saw, now that you bring it up, I don't, I don't comfortable mention this, what, what I see, you would think something's wrong here, seriously wrong. And, um, it's, I'm scared. I'm actually going to go to an attorney. I was going to go to an attorney after this, see about fighting a lawsuit. But after what she told me last night, I'm afraid to do that now. To, to, to stop the, I actually wasn't going to come here, but I thought, well, you, you, you know, the auditor that might be here today might say, from Carol, might think, well, why did he waste my time? So I thought, I'm just going to, I, well, I, go, to, I go to the gym every morning. That's my look like this, by the way. I, I, every morning, 8 30. I meet a friend of mine named Steve there. And we work out, so I so I came like this because I'm supposed to be here in a few minutes. But well, you know the chases. Yes. Tim and his wife Gail like me a great deal. Uh, Tim, don't even ever ask him. Um, shovels my driveway when it snows every winter. He's extremely pleasant. And but uh, oh boy, and then his brother moved in. He was the one that was screaming the profanities at me. So, it's just been an awful experience. So, my suggestion, Kevin, for now, until we can talk about this, to save your chickens, yeah. build something. Yeah, you're right, that's really important. And, and then you've got more of a control of, of. Yeah. But I, I know what dogs now you're talking. The one I shot two years ago was a, not uh, like a layout. That was the one that was doing all the damage. And uh, I actually, I actually told the deputy, I have to say this, I'm sorry, because this burns me. It was the worst day of my life getting arrested. I told that man, I saw, I got home, I had not secured the door well enough. Two of the dogs, a little one named Romeo, and I don't know what the white one was in my coop killing my chickens. I told that deputy that her dogs, they were flying to her, and it, he wrote in the report, Colin saw a dog run across the yard, which makes me look like the county attorney reading the report a lunatic. He also, when I told him there was, I got four dead, bleeding chickens in my yard right now, he told, he smirked, rolled his eyes, smirked and rolled his eyes at me, and, and said, how do you know a fox did it? He didn't put any of that in the report, which we, that's why I had to shot him out there. But none of that was mentioned. So it just made me look like a lunatic. And I gotta tell you, after 30 years of being a cop, never shooting a dog, never pointing a gun on a, on a person, I deeply resented that. I told Kim Clark what he did. I mean, I don't know if anything was done. So I'm, I'm pretty bitter about that. Well, I would tell you the, the easiest and the so part of it is we've been around our place we go and buy uh, dog kennels, yeah. panels, you buy one with a gate in it, buy three or four more and hook them together. And they're, they're sturdy enough that you can 
you want to, you can put a net over the top and it'll hold it. You want to put it together. That, that's the quickest thing you can build right now. Yeah. You know, well, I, I can keep them in there. The, actually, that building is their. Well, I have goat, a couple goats down. That, that's their, their coop. I could keep them in the building all day. Until. I, I like your idea. I feel stupid for not having thought about that. But it would, yeah, it'd be, yeah, it'd have to it be pretty help. tall. I mean, I mean, do they literally make chain link fence that tall? This is six foot tall. Yeah, well, the, those exotic birds, like I said, I they, they go like feds. I mean, they can go. They can buy chain there's a oh well then there's a netting go go online and oh it's the netting. i know what you're talking about exactly so just come just get a six foot cover the net and don't worry about it you know what can I, and we put a pole in no, the middle of that. and oh so they have a oh, exactly kind of like an eight, eight three meter zoo yeah. you got it <laughs> it would be they would think they'd be in a holiday you buffet i'll go to farm market yeah, later today yeah. But try that until we can get this solved. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for listening thank to my you. little diatribe. Well, thank you for but coming I, in. I and and we understand this could be, you know, a lot of people are going to start moving out into the country, and they got to yeah. understand. You have dogs. You've got to. Yeah, these people. You've got to be responsible for it. Kim and Gail care. Jake. Yeah. Does not. Yeah. Does not care. Yeah. And anyway. so understand. Alright, well thanks for your time. Thanks for coming in, Kevin. Bye. You can stay if you want. Oh, now I have to get to the gym. I do that stairway tire <laughs> every morning like religious, so. Bye. Thank you. Nice meeting you. still tough to find and sometimes they put them on clothes. Uh, nitrogen gloves seem to be a very hot topic. Uh, but, uh, they're available, if they are available at high cost, then 
and some sites are available in the industry. The past piece is great to try and pull you out when you're having a high and burn rate and you have some oxidations. So we're trying to help where we can on that. We have some resources that don't, don't stay in multiple that we require to uh, help support that. Are you having problems getting your supplies there? and see how they supervise that because uh, um, you know it's tough to supervise things like football. It's really tough when you walk down through there and look for some halfway by you know try to do the best you can but then you don't see enough surveillance in there and so it's just something that's it's really hard to do out there. And the environment we're trying to live in. So I think they're doing the best job they can. Um, the uh Julie participated in the conference call here recently where I could hospitals, health services, uh, long-term care, um, you know, emergency medical services, EMS, things like that, you're, where you're caring for people. Um, that, what it's going to be, as far as right now, supported, it's just that you may close out on the 15th, and then you'll start a new uh, application in, in the 16th on. So I would think the school knows would fall into that, but I don't know. So we're not checking. State is going to handle this COVID 19. We have asked the states to play their role in addition to the state role. So, I'm going to put the phone conference call. It looks like we're going to be able to expedite uh, the, the processing of those claims and the turnaround of the federal funding for, uh, for operation purposes and expense. So, that's going to be good getting money back in.
is suggesting that if you look for COVID for the months of March and September 15th and 30th, they were much more local than what they get paid. Starting September 15th, they turned over to the best team for healthcare and hospitals who are patient care. So that's a big shift. Like, so, um, so now it is from 16 on is how much you paid them if you wouldn't go to probation. They are now registration for the patient. That we knew this was probably going to be there. Well, I, I had feelings coming to Keno. The biggest one we knew in and of is not big. You know, bigger disasters for recovery. We're recovery in total the air, right? Right. So, but we're still responding at the same time. So, this is unique disaster. It's different than any one of your partners for this. So, congratulations. Quick CARES update for you. Um, you know, on that the deadline for submitting the CARES Act is today. So anyway, that's that's underway and I they want to do more for us and try and get that off. And Carol, you had been the one that you had some stuff too. Yeah. So is that what's been happening? Yeah, you know, the question I don't well no, I don't, don't have anything to put my steps on the road. That's what on I mean. my care. That's what I mean. So so I think our residual is around sixty five thousand. Show up. 
Well, we used to be able to do that, but our health insurance won't let us do that anymore because it has to be because it's covered under our insurance, and so it has to be billed. Yes. So. Yes, but I would like you to think of public health as a job killer. So it's if you have people that aren't paid, our life is not. To Supervisor sat there and would look at Suzanne and says, Well, don't we qualify? You know, but no, you're, you're law enforcement, you're re, your first responders, everybody's looking at this hazardous pay part. And I'm going, Wait a minute, folks. If you're in this field, hazardous is hazardous. I mean, so we had quite a little bit of discussion on that. Just some things that come up that I had never.
signed the agreement two weeks ago um, as far as liability and uh, indemnification and uh, right of employee abuse which um, not been in any of your clients in addendum. Kind of more here two weeks ago made of I assume still again um, we agreed to have an addendum for the surcharge fee that we're still surcharge amount I guess that was never formally stated in there it's, it's not a I wouldn't say it's no it's not we're not going to reduce it at all no it's not what it's saying okay but it's a re, is it a rejection of the reduction to five cents yeah we told you that the first time okay um I guess but that was the only question I really had I wasn't really sure just reading through the letter um understand I understand language written in the letter and um, why you're at on your guys' stance on the situation, I guess. What do we got to do to come to an agreeable number? Do we have to, uh, does, do we have to provide some additional information on why we think it should be reduced to where it should be or I guess. I wouldn't go through that much effort. Last I thought, two times ago, I thought you guys were going to go back with a different offer. But Greg said, no, we're going five cents. He kind of just got me off guard. I really thought we were getting somewhere in between. Yeah. Be, I mean, I so understand I, the 35 cents. I get that. I mean, you're not going to be trucking that much, as much soil. And you're still going to have heavy equipment moving the conveyors in and out. You're still going to have heavy trucks maintaining them. There's still going to be some heavy truck traffic, whether it be hauling dirt or yeah, so I when I went back to the vice president to rewrite the letter and look at um, what our offer should be according to just the, the sense portion sure. of it, I I took kind of we took all the traffic we were going to have, and then now all the traffic that's going to be there, we kind of just did a percent. We figure okay, well now that we have X percent of traffic we're going to what we planned on, let's just go with that number. When you do that, it's like three-tenths of a cent, and I, and I knew that was unacceptable, sure. so that's why we stayed at five cents. Because at five cents, it's about right around like $1,000 a day we'll be paying, and that's just to have our pickups running up and down the road. I mean, that there shouldn't be really any heavy truck traffic until we go to pick it all back up. It should just be pickups and side-by-sides. I mean, there's no fuel. It's all electric. You won't have big fuel trucks. Just have our our maintenance guys operate you know, little Pan Am buggies with welders on it, and the only time they're on the road really is when they cross it to the other side. No, so I mean that that we didn't come up back to five cents to try to stiff anyone or anything. Sure. We, when we actually ran the numbers, which I don't have in front of me, which you could produce, but when you run the numbers, the, the percentage of impact 
now versus running all the trucks, we came up to less than five cents, so that's, that's why we stayed in five cents. And what I have a problem with, here we are in the middle of, not maybe not in the middle, but of your operation, and we're talking about trying to make an agreement. You knew what the cost of this project was going to be when you came into it. Surely you knew that. And you knew that we charged 35 cents a yard for extraction fee. I mean, you, you know that. We have contractors that work down here on the levee during the flood and stuff that paid the 35 cents and never touched our roads. The one time their trucks touched the road was going in and out for fuel in the morning and night. That's it. Didn't take any loaded. So I have a problem. We charge them 35 cents. They never touch the roads. You say, you're not touching the roads. But you aren't. But you want to pay a piddly nickel, which gets us nothing. You know, uh, we've been to court, lost court battles and things over extraction fees years ago. Neither one of these people were on the board when I was on it. Uh, and that's the reason we came up with this, you know, to uh, more or less control what's going on. But I'm not saying that maybe you should pay the whole 35 cents, but you you still have to respect what we have to do down here. Uh, mainly thing I'm upset is you guys have been running for how long? With trucks and the conveyor, you know, but maybe only a week or so on the conveyor, but uh, now we're going to sit here and argue over what you think you should pay and what we should give in to. And the trucking you're paying 35 cents. What's that? The trucking you're oh, paying. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, when you bid this project, did you not bid with the 35 cents and with this? So now we want to pull out after we get the belts rolling? We didn't bid it with the conveyor. You didn't bid it with the conveyor. You no. bid it with all the trucking. Yeah. Our conveyor, our conveyor operation side of things comes from out west from another division of our company, which this information might not be the most useful, but it comes out west and it just happened to fall in line where a bunch of equipment freed up at just the right time and they just sent it all this way for us to use because it's already being installed. So it was, it was, it was our intention to truck everything and I mean, when do we start the permit process for the conveyor? In March. End of March, April. 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 So, how many yards are you going to convey again, roughly? Uh, Three million? Five million. I thought it was 8.5. Yeah, it's about 8.5. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying that the other dirt haulers have called me and they're saying if we let you guys get by, we'll go to court with the others. Because like Richard said, there was some that never touched our roads and they paid the 35 cents and they said they will be pissed because, and they'll say, you know what, we'll see you in court. And then we got to pay them thousands and thousands and thousands because we let them get by. You know, we're, we're a county that tries to do the same for all. And like Richard said, they never touched our roads and they pay because it's an extraction fee. So I, I'm just saying, I don't want to go to court. I, I think you guys realize this is what happens. Um, you're taking a big chunk out of Mills County, that's for sure. Um, and I just think 35 cents is piddly of it's a big number in the long in, in the whole scope of things. And I understand you're gonna have an expense for your conveyor belt whether you own it or not. You gotta get it here, you gotta maintain it, you gotta get this appreciation. I mean there's several other factors I don't even know about. You know, I get that part of it, but it's it's all and you guys are wanting nothing. It's I would like to meet somewhere in between and, and avoid all this and put it to bed and move on and get our jobs done. Uh, 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 uh,
General discussion. That is attached to the blade of the to, to the maintainer's uh, side hydraulic. So oh, to the side hydraulic. Oh, okay. So, so we're going to share. I mean, how are we? You're just buying one. Right here. Just buying one, and we'll rotate it through our streets. Okay. Uh, search greater attached.
Yeah, the yep. solution. Yep. It's called the Retriever. Simple, yet incredibly effective. That goes with a film page. No, right. There will be a single head dog. Is that a... Is that a brush? No, big heavy disc. Yeah, it's just a disc. Oh, this is a disc. Oh, this is a disc. Oh, this is a disc. So we'll, we'll definitely follow up with the most difficult yeah. shoulder conditioning yeah. problem. Yeah. And the yeah. 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 retriever saves yeah. money. Yeah. That's how it works. The yeah. retriever's disc yeah. gag is designed to cut and with mulch and our paved roads and our uh, gravel roads. Well, probably the primary thing. Because on the paved road, it's not that close. So you don't need the paved yeah, yeah, we were more than close to the bike. Say goodbye to the when using the blade. The retriever will be the So the conditioned material is <laughs> not waste. This method of shoulder conditioning eliminates the practice of yeah. healing our But it looks like, like it, it, it looks like it chops socks. up the grass pretty well. Yep. A lot better than the big chunks that the maintainer. So I'll be bringing that here in the next. And the other piece of equipment uh, we've discussed before is the culvert cleaner. I think you got it. We never did. Oh, okay. It. Um, That's it goes on and you can attach it to any backhoe or uh, excavator that we have. And it has a little kit. I think two six foot extensions so we can reach. Is that the length that will get through the other side? The so, so we probably, probably get like halfway and then have to go through it. A couple different folks have had us. The federal share is like four hundred and ninety five thousand or seven hundred thousand. Okay. And the only reason I ask that is because those dollars to NACH a lot of times to Jill and then she's like, Is this yours? Is this yours? 
So if I kind of know the dollar amount, dollar. that'll yep. be. Mm -hmm. And we'll uh, 667,000 change or something. Yeah. And, and federal share is 75%. Oh, okay. I'll be, uh, State uh, share of it. So do we have to pay us that reasonable time or is he done? Uh, we have two more two more invoices to pay for the five minutes plus one more day and we have to for seating for the life. Oh Usually there's a little more of a break going through when they can get in and oh. out. But and a second to approve. We authorize the chair to sign a national disaster recovery project and to obligate construction funds. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor?
honest, you ladies can move up from behind the screen. City special election. We don't have all the things. We saved them money because we made our own. We made ballots. We only we had two people there, and then Lori and I went and counted them. But we had to keep the polls open all day, so from seven to eight. So there's three hundred dollars there, um, plus um, paper. And it's not going to be huge for them, but. Guys, we approve this. Oh. I make a motion to approve Julia Damro and Tom Bain to be on the City Council of Silver City. Second. Okay. a motion and a second to approve the canvas of the Silver City Special Election. Is there any other discussion? Hearing that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we've been at 11 o'clock, and we're obviously not going to wait for her. We'll address that at 11, so we're going to have a discussion. So, Mr. McDowell? How are you? Good, how are you? Good. 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 I didn't get a chance to meet you last week. I'm Tad McDowell. Tad, I'm Carol Dixon. Nice to meet you. Uh, so, uh, I did bring in some additional information. I know you weren't here last time. I did talk to Lonnie and Richard. Uh, I have some questions, concerns about our assessments okay. in those times. Uh, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to rehash what we already talked about, because we already talked about it quite a bit. 
Um, you've seen the emails, though, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you know, I've got some more stuff here. Uh, Christine, I was hoping, uh, uh, before I, I show some of this information to them, could you define uh, the terms coefficient of dispersion and price-related differential for the board? Come up here, Christine. I feel more comfortable back here. We, I'm sorry, what were the terms you just asked for, Pat? Coefficient of dispersion and price-related differential. I, I'm, I'm going to hand some stuff out. I was hoping she could. Okay. So I'll do it right now. She's going to provide those for us. The coefficient of dispersion measures the uniformity of assessments in the county. And the PRD, the price-related differences, is measures progressively the high end or if the high end are over appraised compared to low end and high end properties that are under appraised. So if, if with, your, uh, with your agreement, I just want to paraphrase that, these are the two main metrics we can look at to find out if our assessments are equitable throughout the county. It's in a formula. It's mm -hmm. not the only thing. No, I, I, but there are, two, like the, there are two metrics that we can look at. Can't. Okay. Um, so the first document on there is the uh, 2018 sales sales ratio study from the state. Okay. And on the fourth page, there's a highlighted line where Mills County is. What year did you say? I'm sorry. This, this is the most recent one, 2018. Uh, so Mills County, our price-related differential is 116.1. That number is supposed, if, if things are equal, that number is supposed to be between 0.98 and 1.03. Uh, the COD, or the coefficient of dispersion, is 27.85. And if all things were, if things were correct, that should be below 20. So when we look, sorry, the, and I know I'm bouncing around the first page, has the definitions. This is right out of the sales study. The coefficient of dispersion, in general, a coefficient of dispersion in excess of 20 indicates the existence of an inequitable assessment pattern for, different, for that particular class of real estate. It's very, very cut and dry there, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, again, down at the bottom, it talks about a PRD being greater than one or less than one, uh, and what that means. Uh, I'm going to leave that document. We'll come back to it later. But uh, the next document is the is a report from the Mason City Assessor, and I know they're from Mills County, but it's just over uh, peer checking. Uh, on the last page, I highlighted a couple statements. After their uh, after their reappraisal project. They were trying to get a COD 15 or less and a PRD uh, between 0.98 and 1.03. That, that, that's, that's where things are supposed to be, ideally. Does that make sense? And you don't have to, you do not have to believe it. Like, I just want you to listen and then I'd like you to go do some research on your own and just reflect on what I say. Thank you. That's what I'm asking. Uh, so, I also threw in a standard on ratio studies. This is a much larger document. I just printed out the, the relevant pages. Uh, in this, it talks about the coefficient of dispersion. And on the back page, it talks about what those what those levels should be if things are fair and equal. And it should be, it's 5 to 15 in a, in a single family residential and older or more heterogeneous areas. It does talk about other residential right below it, rural, 5 to 20. Uh, you know, to what extent is Mills County rural and, and urban? I mean, Clearly, it's more rural, right? I, I know that, uh, but I don't know that Glenwood is rural. I, I don't know where. I don't, you know, it's kind of a gray area, there, right? It's more right. rural is I don't know. Uh, but, but that document outlines where these where these values should be. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. Uh, go on. Uh, well, actually, I didn't even hand this one out yet. So, what I want to show you, actually. I only have one copy of this, I'm sorry. This is from the state of Utah, by the way. So this is actually to be compared to the state of Iowa. And I know that's from Utah. I get the one in Iowa. But it's a good comparison tool to look at. This is Iowa sales studies. These are the same numbers. There's their PRDs and there's their CODs. Okay, they're all basically within those windows. Every county in the state, what was, what was surprising to me is how bad Iowa is overall. I was not good overall when compared to Utah. Utah looks like they're completely squared away. I was all in the map. Uh, again, I'll let you reflect on that down the road. Uh, that's just my conclusion from looking at, at Utah's and Iowa's. I've looked at some other states. Um, so, 
Uh, a couple things. Is this right? I'm not sure if I'm reading that last time. Let's look at one micro example, and then I have a, a few things I want to share with you, just a few graphs and my conclusions. So I put in this. I know this is small writing. I apologize. Uh, this is in the spreadsheet that I've sent to you all as well. So this is this is this is Malvern. There's sales that were included in the 2018 sales study. Okay, there are homes in here. We already talked about this. Their sales ratios are between 36 percent and 314 percent of market value. That's a pretty big range. Now. Those three at the bottom that are highlighted in red are highlighted in red because there's clearly something with those properties. Right? And then when we look at the sales price, they sold for 27, 26, and 21 back. That looks to me like they were probably rehab rentals. Right? Homes that sold bottom barrel, um, and that's so they probably, you know, bottom as a fixer upper. So they don't really truly represent you know, a good market price. They're not good statistical data points because the assessment was, you know, 60. Seventy thousand dollars. You're selling for twenty thousand. There's a reason for that. I assume. Uh, I bring this up uh, primarily though to illustrate down here in the yellow. Uh, in Malvern specifically, the bottom eleven homes make up sixty percent of the market on the, in this sales study. The top eleven homes make up thirty-eight percent of the market. What that means then is that we're taking our most expensive homes in Malvern and assessing them below market value. I'm taking our are our least expensive homes in Melbourne and assessing them above market value or slightly above. Right? That's important because in Oak, it's completely flip flop. I don't have a similar spreadsheet for Oak, but based on what I'm looking at, the roles are flip flop. So the higher homes in Oak are assessed higher than the lower priced homes. Does that make sense? Uh, so there's many different ways that we're transferring tax burden in this country, and that's, that's one of them. Uh, so, I'm going to take a step back now. I'm going to hand out another graph. This is the certificate of dispersion for Mills County since 2011. Okay, and actually, there's Mills County, uh, Winnishape, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Bremer counties, uh, compared with the Iowa median and the, the Iowa standard and the industry standard of 20 and 15. So, as you can see, Mills County is really high right now, like really high. What, what I'm having a hard time understanding is why Bremer consistently has a COD below 15, and ours is pretty consistently above 20. Do you know what the population of Bremer is? They are very comparable. I did. We're 15. One of them is 20. The other one's 25. I think that's comparable, uh, and that's why I picked those counties. Uh, so I could do the same graph with every county. And it's true that there are counties in Iowa that are worse than Mills. That's true. But that doesn't make them, you know, if we're, if we're all failing, that doesn't really, that's not really a good thing. Uh, lastly, uh, I've got another graph here. So I went last night and I took the four major metrics here. And this is COD, PRD, coefficient variation, standard deviation. Okay? And I took every single county for every single year back to 2011. And, and, I, and, I, and I ordered them by each factor. Okay, so for us, right now in 2018, Mills County is sitting in the 15th percentile. Meaning, we're, meaning our, I'm sorry, for, for COD, for, for coefficient of dispersion, we're in the 15th percentile. Meaning we're the 15th worst. I'm sorry, 15, do you understand what I'm saying there? When I say the 15th percentile. Um, for PRD, we're in the 8th percentile. For standard deviation and coefficient of variation, we're in the sixth percentile. So what that means is that we're just about the worst in the state. Not the worst, but really close. And, and this graph shows you what's happened over the last decade to all those values. That's our relative position within the state of Iowa against our peers. We have gotten worse and worse and worse. And, and I can't ever say that we were ever really good. Now, if, if, now, Christina would be able to tell us more for exactly. We, I believe we did a full reassessment in 2011. Is that right? That's what I've heard? 11, yeah. Okay. So, so when we fixed our problem, we still really weren't all that fixed. When you go over here and look at Mason City, you can see right here, here's their, here's their comparison before and after. 
after their reappraisal project, their PRD was 1.02, and their COD was 7.61. I mean, they were, they were money, right? They were right on. Now, again, there's going to be some deviation over time. I think everybody knows that. Like, that's going to happen. I'm not, we're not asking for perfection. But the question is, is it okay to be in the bottom 15%? I don't feel we are, Tad, with your numbers. Okay. Well, you can do the math yourself. We are in the top 15%. The, the, the numbers are the numbers. Okay. Um, it is what it is. So I spent the morning talking to a lady named Julie Poison at the state. Do you know Julie? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Julie and I had, had about an hour-long conversation. Now, Julie does not have all this information. I mean, she just, she's just at the state. She doesn't know what, what's going on in Mills County. Uh, she said, assuming what you're telling me is true, and that's all she can do on the phone. Okay, but I'm not seeing the phone. Assuming you're telling me, assuming what you're telling me is true, then it sounds like your county has some has some significant issues that we need to work on. So again, there's nothing much I can do past this point. I've shown you how bad this county's assessments are. And I don't even think that we can debate anymore that our assessments are are are, are inequitable. They are, if I've proven it. And, and I've shown you that we're really bad amongst our peers. We're a bad county in a bad state. I mean, and we don't have to be. We don't have to be. I don't want to be. I don't. Do you want to be? Do you? Okay. So what I'm at, you know what I'm asking. I've already asked you. I want a clear and decisive plan. I want clear and decisive action on the part of the board and the assessor in this county to fix this problem. I know it can't be fixed overnight. This is way too big of a problem. But I'm asking for a plan, and I want to know what we're going to do to fix this. And again, I don't expect you to, to just, you know, I expect you to go home, reflect on this, look at it, listen to what I'm saying, and then come to a conclusion as a board or individually, however you guys do work, and then do something about it. Is that reasonable? And then, well... The separate issue is my house, and we'll deal with that down the road. I absolutely believe I'm being overtaxed significantly. Probably 750 to 1500 per year. The problem is, our data is so, like, there's so many factors here that I can't say that definitively. I don't, you know, you can't say it definitively. But I do know that when we've looked at comparable homes around the area, my home is assessed at a way higher percentage of market value than other homes. Like, I've, I've demonstrated that in the spreadsheet that I sent to you. So, again, we'll deal with my, my house a separate issue, I'm here because of this issue. You, I believe this, this entity can influence the conference board and the assessor into fixing this problem. What's going through my head right now that is you understand A lot of them don't understand it. The tax dollars pay your new school and the pool and the sports complex. Yeah, I want to right. stop paying taxes. I want to pay my fair share in taxes. Right. And right. I, that's all I want. I want to pay my fair share of what you're doing, not intentionally. I don't think you're intentionally doing it. I, I think there's an element of maybe we're just not doing a very good job of it. You told me two weeks ago you're doing your job right, and I just don't think these numbers support that. That I wasn't. When you went to, um, when you went in to discuss your um, concerns mm -hmm. with the, um, I should say, when you met with the board, mm -hmm. the board of review, but you had an attorney do yeah. it for so you? I did not meet with the board of review. Okay. okay. You got an attorney. That's right. In hindsight, I would have done way more homework then. Like, I was told that, oh, everybody's assessments went up. So the way we do taxes, if everybody's assessments go up 15%, then it doesn't matter. Right? Everybody in the county is going 15%. The, you guys set the budget and you divvy up taxes. If everybody went up 15%, it should be pretty equal if everybody was equal. Right? Well, the problem is, not everybody in the county went up 15%. The, the, I didn't realize that at the time. I just looked at my neighbors. Oh, yep, sure enough, everybody's assessments went up 15%, so I dropped it. But then when the bills came out, of course, well, I got a lot more taxes here. What happened? 
Well, then I started looking into things, thinking I'm not going to rehash everything. Mm -hmm. and there's at least four or five different ways that I'm on the wrong end of this deal in this county right now. Uh, things like Malibu being assessed at 83% of market value, while my buyer is at 96%. That's how you're shifting tax burden from one area to another. Uh, things like in my own neighborhood, there's 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 a, there's, there's a range of values. Okay, and in my own neighborhood, I'm I'm above the median, not much. I'm just about the median, but I, I am I'm still on the wrong side of that equation. When I go back to my old neighborhoods too, we talked about this yesterday. Well, my old neighborhoods in Brentwood, Nebraska, and Harnett County, North Carolina, and that's in the, this is in that spreadsheet as well. Every single home, not every one. Sorry, there were a couple outliers. Removing the top and bottom value, every home was within an 11% range of market value. Okay, not perfect, but consistent. Consistent. You know what? If you're within, if there's a, a plus or minus 5%, I think people can live with. The problem is, we're plus or minus 15, 20, or uh, yeah, plus or minus 20% in some cases. That's a 40% swing. I, I don't know how we can justify that. I don't think we can. And this requires constant vigilance to not happen again. So the question is, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do to fix it? And then what are we going to do to make sure it doesn't happen in the future? Because that's really, truly what I'm concerned about. This shouldn't happen. Oh. I don't have much else. Say again. It's very interesting. Well, Thank you. Lisa, I, I, are, are my, is my request clear right now? Just I want to make sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, what is a reasonable time frame for the board to take a look at this, to determine if action is necessary, and to and to get back to me with an answer, yes, it's necessary, and we're going to create a plan over the next, I'm just going to give you an example. Hey, you know what? We think we, think we do need to fix it, and it's going to take us two months to come up with a plan. And we're going to get you that plan in two months. Like, is, is Vanguard doing some appraisals? They are. Like Mason County report that we have here, that was to for her to be able to get a reappraisal. You guys have already, with the conference board, have already committed to doing the reappraisal. And the only way we can do it is the sales ratio study. You know, in mass appraisal, that is how it is done across the state. Um, my law that I have to go by is Chapter 441. The rules of how I have to administrate this is Chapter 17 of the Iowa Administrative Code. I am overseen by the state. Every sale that we have goes to the state. And I believe, Tad, I gave you the state, all the sales that went to the state. At least to Melbourne and Oak, I believe, right? Or did, was that the second one you yep. just sent me? You just sent me something all yesterday. of them okay. were given to you. Um, we do not have the problem to the extent you are saying. You, you know, we disagree. So Does this board really have? No. I didn't think they had power to. You went to the board of review. We talked about this yesterday. Conference board does not meet, but what? Once a year? That's what you say. This is the only place to go. Okay, the state, this is interesting by the way, not just a fact. The state does not care if we are equitably assessed within the county. They do not care in any way, shape, or form. Okay? All they care about, and the reason they issue equalization orders, is that each county is is basically assessed at market value. Because what they do, they use that, they use the data collected there to disperse state aid out. They want to make sure they, they want to make sure that aid is dispersed equitably. That's why the state wants us within a window, every county. But they don't care about individual properties. They don't care that Malvern's assessed at eighty-three percent and Oak is at ninety-six percent. They do not care at all. We should. I do. Okay, I definitely care about it. Um, this this sales ratio stuff or this uh, real estate reappraisal project that takes two years. It's going to take two to three years for that to be reflected in my property taxes. That's not okay with me. It shouldn't be okay with me. Like, there's got to be some other way, some interim measure. Yes, that, that real or that project needs to be done, clearly. But there needs to be some interim fixes too, because it's not okay. If you believe this, 
then it's not okay to keep overtaxing people for the next two or three years. I, I don't think it is anyways, because I'm going to be the victim here. Uh, Tad, you can do an appraisal to come into the Board of Review uh -huh. and definitely mark to do an oral hearing. Because when your lawyer... If I do an appraisal, or you said I have to... I did an appraisal on the property. Okay. Right, the the appraisal. Is, I've already told you this a thousand times. She doesn't, she's not listening to me. My home is assessed correctly. My home is assessed at market value. It seems, and I'm just throwing out a number here, 65% of the county is below market value. Okay, I, don't, I don't have the entire database. I don't, just based on the research I've done, there's a lot of people that are assessed under market value. So what good is it going to do me to come in and say, look, I have this appraisal. My house says it's worth 450000 Oh, look, you're assessed at 450000 Max hand. That's what they're going to tell me. So the problem is I'm challenging everybody else's assessment, not mine. Nobody's going to come in and say, man, I'm assessed at half my market value. Have you ever heard anybody complain about that? <laughs> Nobody does that. So that's what I'm here doing. I'm complaining that they are assessed at half their market value. I've given you all the evidence. I don't think there needs – I'm not going to continue to beat this dead horse. We are inequitably assessed. The facts are clear. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Again, there needs to be an interim measure. There needs to be a, a, a fix, which is a real estate re reappraisal project. And then some mechanism by which the county ensures this doesn't happen again. So let me ask you that. We've been above this 20% threshold. Sorry, this graph. Our COD has been above 20%. Where, where, where the state of Iowa says that things are beginning to get inequitable. We've been there since 2014. What have we done since 2014 about it? We assess every two years. We put sales ratios together, mm -hmm. the only way we can do it without a reappraisal. And then we, because you can't put the same increase on Malvern as you can. Like, did, you, right. did you ask, okay, going back over here by the well. Did you ever, did you ask in 2014 for a reappraisal project when our COD was over 20? No, okay. I don't believe I did. Maybe she should have. Maybe she should have. Like, hey, board, here you go. Look, look at the sales study. It when says we're equitable. When did we have our last appraisal? Eleven. Eleven. Right. And if you think we can afford one every three years, get your checkbook if out. If you now. think my checkbook's already out, Richard, well, it's, it's already it's out. It's going to get a lot worse if we're going to have an appraisal every three years. Okay. Then maybe, maybe, okay, Lonnie, Richard, why does Wenishea County, why does Bremer County do so much better than Mills County? Maybe we should send Christine over there and figure out what they're doing. How can you guys be so darn good at this and we're so darn poor? Like, do some benchmarking. That's a pretty affordable option. Again, I don't know what they're doing. I'm not a professional appraiser I'm not, or a professional assessor. That's Christina's job. Although I've learned more in the last month about this than I ever thought I would. So, this can be fixed. This is not okay to tax me hundreds to thousands more than I should be. You're not even looking at me, Richard. Please, consider what I'm saying. And please fix this. Okay, I don't need to monopolize any more of your day. I have monopolized more than enough of your time. I'm sorry to flood your email inbox. Have, have I made my point? Okay. When can I expect to hear back from you? When is a reasonable time frame? I, I don't know right now if we can click them. I mean, you've got to do a lot of reading and studying and calling. That I, I... Okay, give me a follow-up schedule. I just want, all I want you to do is commit to following up with me on a regular basis. And, and I'm, I'm letting you define the time here. And, like, okay, I don't know what I can give you an answer, but I'm going to follow up with you every two weeks to let you know where we're at. Because I'll tell you what, like, it's, would you all agree that a year is too long here? Like, I'm asking for an answer before a year. Okay? A week is probably too short. There's some reasonable time frame here, a month or two, I would think, at most, that you could get, that you could make a decision on this. Um, you know, spend a couple weekends on it. I know I did. I will, I will send you Julie's information, her email, because her, I mean, again, I, 
this is a different language too. And this is a different language. Being, you know, the, ling the lingo they use in the, in the assessment world is completely different than the way we normally talk with one another. They throw out terms that you just, you don't intuitively know what they mean. Who knows what coefficient of dispersion is? Well, I didn't two weeks ago, but I do now. And I understand its relevance. Uh, I don't expect you to just know everything. It, it, take, it does take time. So please take the time. Again, I've already said this. And I, I don't want to put words in my because I don't want you to come up with the title. Is every two weeks reasonable for you to get in touch with me to tell you, or to basically say we're working on this and I'm going to get back to you with an answer? Is, is that reasonable? If not, tell me what's reasonable. Just give me a Give us a month. A month for an answer? See where our okay. plan is. What okay, do okay. Do? I will what? give you a month to get back to me with something. I would say that I would like, I'm, this is my expectation as a taxpayer. I'm asking for a plan within the next quarter. If this is a significant issue, that I'm going to write a check. I don't, I'm, I'm, dollars are coming out of my checking account, and I don't think it's fair. But I'm going to pay them because I don't really have a choice. I like my house. Okay? So, uh, one month. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I am oh. a neighbor in the, well, I'm not yet. I'm building a house in Lake Ohana, and I've been following the emails and all. And partly moved here. This is supposed to be a low-income, you know, general state compared to where I came from. I came from Virginia. And my property tax for a $450,000 house, well, actually four sixty, dollars I guess I sold it for, uh, was $3,600 a year. So uh, when these emails started flying, I'm going, uh, how can they be so high here? So I am hoping as a new resident to see some, for the emails he's been sharing with us, some results that that don't scare me that I've made the wrong mistake to come to, to Iowa. I have family here, and I you know, wanted to be here with them, and I thought, oh, this will be great. It's not going to cost me as much to live here as it did in Virginia. Well, now I'm questioning that, so please, you know, take a look. I mean, when you start talking about tax on a house being $8,000, it's not two, two and a half times what I'm used to paying on taxes, so... You know, somewhere, I don't know quite what all you're spending it on, but I do understand it. I was a teacher for 46 years. It was my salary coming in. Um, uh, and I know how many things, you know, you have more trouble with roads. We didn't. We don't have the extremes where I was living. So I know you have the roads to patch, and you have the police and the fire department, which I adore. Please pay them and send them out when we need them. But uh, I, I just look, and somebody's paying 65 below, you've got to make that money up. I know you've got to have a pool this big. And so if they're paying technically 25% less, then somebody's paying 25% more. So I would love to see this even out. I've, just, I've never done it. I've never, well, I take that back. I did go to the city council when they tried to not give us a raise as a teacher. <laughs> but this is the first time I've been in anything other than. So I, I do hope you know, you'll, you'll think about those of us who are <laughs> looking at our, our yearly bill, house is paid for sort of thing, and it's a big chunk when, when you're not doing it a little bit each month. All of a sudden, you really realize how much it is. I thank you for your time. Thank I, you. I appreciate you letting me sit in and listen. Thank you. I, I would encourage just, I'm, we are no longer impartial parties, right? I would encourage you both to reach out, all of you, to reach out to impartial call people from the state, call somebody from those counties, ask them, because those are the people that, you know, they're dead. All righty, it's 11 o'clock. Next item on the agenda is the... <laughs>
code 21.5.1J. I second that. We've got a motion and a second. We want to close session. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Roll call. Crouch? Yes. Smitten? Yes. Mayberry? Yes. Okay. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. 